It's the Pete Callender Show. With more than 20 years as a reporter and radio host in North Carolina, Pete Callender is helping solve the world's problems one podcast at a time. Because he's a giver. And now, here's Pete. What's going on? Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for listening. I do appreciate it. Thanks so much also for the folks who became patrons of the show to help keep it going. They support the program, and so that's why I'm able to do it. Folks like Shelly, Lair, Krista, Sam, Terry and Teresa, Dustin, Deborah, Josh, Joseph, Luella, thank you very much uh, for making the contribution, for uh, becoming patrons of the show. You can as well just by going to thepetecalendarshow.com. There's a link there to become a patron, uh, and then you get access to the exclusive content, the live streams, get some bumper stickers, an end-of-the-year present. I've said too much, so that's on its way, folks. Um, And uh, by the way, if you are a patron, and some folks, they opt out of getting any benefits, uh, they just want to support the show, you can do that as well. But if you decide, you know what, I do kind of want those uh, free swag uh, bumper stickers and such, just uh, let me know. Send me a message and I can update that uh, as soon as possible. Okay, so under the lockdown orders that Governor Cooper has implemented, the stay home or safer at home executive orders, or as I like to refer to them as the SHIO, the SHIO has disproportionately affected bars, taverns, nightclubs, uh, and then also restaurants to a little bit lesser degree than the bars because bars were not even allowed to be open. you got breweries that are in there. A lot of service industry um, hospitality organizations have been really hard hit by uh, the, uh, the the SHIO, the executive orders. Uh, North Carolina has not seen the kind of ridiculous enforcement so far that other states have seen. But it is getting ridiculous, and I suspect we're not too far away from some types of similar activities occurring, particularly as we're seeing numbers go up and politicians now have an incentive to at least appear like they're doing something. And so they go after what is really the low-hanging fruit. It's the bars and the restaurants. So I'm going to talk to Jarrett Dieterly about this uh, very topic in a minute. First, let me tell you about Growers Hemp. They are the newest sponsor of the program. They came on board about a month ago. And Growers Hemp is a company that was founded by farmers uh, to uh, not only, you know, make family farming a go, make it, uh, you know, make it profitable, uh, but also to help people on their wellness journey. So it's a win-win. Growers Hemp, they make CBD products. Obviously, they make hemp products, right? And uh, these are North Carolina farmers. They control the whole process from seed all the way to shelf, and that means better quality and lower cost. And you're supporting North Carolina farmers. So growershemp.com is the website. I take CBD oil. I started taking it about five or six months ago. And uh, there are folks here uh, that listen to the show. We put them into a bit of a focus group, gave them some products and let them uh, try the products out and uh, see what they thought. And here's one. Leslie said, I do like the taste. Light berry. It's not overpowering. Daniel agreed, said they taste great. Uh, It did help me relax and sleep. And that's what I take it for. I I take a few drops before I go to bed and I sleep more deeply than I ever have before. My whole life, I was sort of a a light sleeper and I'd wake up, toss and turn, that sort of thing. Uh, And uh, I take the CBD drops and never again. So uh, that's what it did for me. Now, here's the disclaimer language GovCo requires, as with all CBD products, these statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. The efficacy of these products has not been confirmed by FDA-approved research. These products are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease, and nothing I have said is meant as a substitute for or alternative to information from your healthcare provider. Please consult your healthcare professional about potential interactions or other possible complications before using any product. So go to growershemp.com, use the promo code PETE, and you'll get 20% off. From North Carolina farmers to your home, Growers Hemp, it's about the hemp and not the hype. Joining me now is Jarrett Dieterly. He is the author of a book called Give Me Liberty and Give Me a Drink, 65 Cocktails to Protest America's Most Outlandish Alcohol Laws. He is also the Director of Commercial Freedom and a resident senior fellow at the R Street Institute. You can read his work at rstreet.org. And welcome to the show, Jarrett. How are you? 
I'm doing great. Thank you very much for having me. Certainly. So there are two different components here. Um, and so I guess we'll start opposite of how I introduce them. But uh, the first is sort of all of these regulations on alcohol. And I guess the COVID pandemic here really has brought a lot of this stuff to the surface. A lot of people were not aware of some of the some of the laws that govern bars and uh, nightclubs and breweries and restaurants. And depending on what state you're in, right, there are all different rules. Um, and right. so there, we're seeing a lot of these, especially the longer the pandemic goes and the lockdowns go and the restrictions, we see, we're seeing more and more fights, right, between this friction between generally bar owners and um, and government, right? So you, you've, uh, you've got a piece at rstreet.org called New York is seriously running stings and finding bars for not serving enough food. Um, and <laughs> you I like this one story from a place called Pint Sized. So tell us about Pint Sized. What is it and what happened there? Yeah, well, they're a, a craft beer bar uh, in uh, upstate New York, and they essentially, you know, serve beer like most places. Uh, and during, you know, the pandemic, one of the requirements, you've seen this in other states, but New York did it uh, too, that you need to serve some amount of food if you are a bar restaurant with the drinks that you serve. I, I don't exactly know what, uh, it's never made much sense to me what the idea behind that is. Um, I, I think it's kind of, they don't want uh, a bunch of, you know, uh, rowdy bar scenes where people are kind of milling about instead of having table service, although it seems like it would just be easier to to say that, that people have to sit at tables. But anyway, so <laughs> the, the, this uh, this brewery was uh, or, or brew shop was required to uh, serve uh, food. They didn't really want to do a complex food thing. That's not their thing. Their thing's beer. So they actually took to actually eventually warming up uh, cans of beans and soup basically to give people with uh, their beer when they would uh, place these orders and <laughs> they 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 basically quickly saw that people weren't really eating as much of this or um, you know any of it really and so instead of kind of having to do a bunch of servings with it depending on the the party size they would just do one bowl and you know for like a table and you know people wanted more they could always ask they just felt really bad about all the food waste they had <laughs> from this and and ultimately it didn't work for them because the uh, state of New York um, agents actually from the uh, liquor regula uh, regulatory agency uh, uh, came in undercover, ordered beer, and were not uh, given the um, enough food, basically, to meet the requirement. So they actually ended up getting a fine for $1,500 for it. It was just one of those things that is crazy on all levels because, you know, first of all, you have to question whether it's really doing anything again, as I said. But even if you think it does, they didn't get notification of the fine until over a month and a half later. And so if we have like a if this is really a public health crisis, you know, why are we only warning people six weeks later? And I think that kind of shows that that probably it wasn't a huge public health concern. And it's kind of it seemed like a little bit busy work for uh, the state uh, law enforcement uh, officials instead of doing stuff that might actually protect us during COVID. Well, and this gets to, I think, well, there's multiple layers, like you, you mentioned earlier. I mean, there, there are so many different layers to this. Number one, I think the the issue is they're trying to target bars, taverns, right, brew pubs, because... Um, in restaurants that predominantly serve food, there's a different license that they have to get with the state because it's right. based on like the percentage of sales that a restaurant does uh, of food versus alcohol, right? And if you get out of whack on that uh, on that ratio, then you risk getting lumped into the other classification. Um, and so restaurants. Everybody's like, oh, they're OK. We can open restaurants just as long as you wear the mask when you walk to the table. And then because COVID, I think, is COVID doesn't exist above or below like five feet. I think that's the deal. So when you're walking, you got to wear right. the mask. When you sit down, take the mask off. COVID doesn't exist down there. And so uh, and I guess the same thing goes for bars. Maybe people are standing more in bars. So they really went after bars. So bars right. then said, hey. Why don't we sling some food at people at the same time we're giving them alcohol and we'll be a restaurant, too. This was I heard of the Cuomo chips <laughs> right up in New yeah. York uh, yeah. where bars were just throwing out around, you know, bags of potato chips. Um, and that led to the ridiculous press conference I saw where the the governor of New York is actually going through and describing what is and is not adequate food like what is what is sustenance and what is not as per the regulatory agents 
Yeah, no, and it's led to a lot of farcical situations like that. Um, in California, they have the, a similar food requirement for bars and restaurants there that serve alcohol, and, and the regulators went into excruciating detail and uh, regulation over what constituted a meal to meet the meal requirement versus what didn't. They actually said that uh, I, I had some fun with that. I wrote a little uh, piece that they actually said salad was not uh, a meal, which I think is news to a lot of people that uh, that eat salads uh, every day, you know, regardless of, of what's on it. Um, but yeah, the, the larger point is, is that yeah, I'm not a, a, a public health um, expert, uh, but I think, it, I think we all can agree that we want people to be safe. Um, and it's just kind of figuring out what is the best way to do that. And yeah, I understand we don't want people up at uh, walking around bars, milling together, you know, having these huge party scenes where no one's uh, being safe. But if if you want that, then again, you could require everyone to be at a table. You could require those tables to be six, 12, whatever feet apart you think is, is the safest thing. You could put capacity limits um, on uh, restaurants and states have done all those things. And so I just don't really know what the value add is of of mandating that someone have a cheeseburger with a beer. I think that you, you, when you do that, as some states have done, even if those places don't want to be doing that, you just get, again, these ridiculous situations where, you know, whether it's the Cuomo chips or whether it's uh, in uh, Pennsylvania, for example, some uh, breweries were literally serving a boiled egg with every pint of beer <laughs> just to do lowest viable thing that, to meet this requirement. Is, <laughs> is that is that really what's making people safe? I mean, are we is the pandemic really riding on whether a boiled egg is served with a, a pint of beer? I would argue probably not. Again, you know, I, I would I fully defer to you know public health experts with with uh, maybe indoor dining might not be safe in certain zones. You know, again, I, I I think it's important to be safe. But when you're doing something that kind of on its face, really, you wonder what value it has to keep us safe. And I think that's where it becomes uh, kind of problematic. Yeah, I'm conjuring up images of you know Cool Hand Luke with these boiled eggs. For people who okay. can, you know, drink a lot of beer, I imagine if you're getting an egg with every single beer, uh, and not to, I mean, I'm thinking there's going to be a lot of bloating, and I'm also thinking that's probably going to be a, a noxious area to be around. <laughs> just, <laughs> yeah, well, I think, and ultimately, I think the reality is that people just aren't eating a lot of this food that comes there, and so then it goes in the trash can, and that's what this this beer bar up in New York was noticing is all this food waste and, you know, pantries have had uh, food shelters and pantries have had huge shortages and difficulty getting food right now. And so, you know, why isn't this food going to stuff like that, I think, is what the employees were trying to do there. And I felt kind of bad for them. They they weren't trying to be malicious and push the envelope or anything like that. They were trying to do the right thing and, and ended up kind of getting uh, uh, ran into this this uh, bureaucratic uh, runaround, uh, mm -hmm. unfortunately, and, and led to getting this time. Well, and it also increases the opportunity for targeted enforcement against particular uh, businesses and business owners. Um, mm -hmm. If you've got, you know, some local agents that know of a bar and they don't like that bar, they could they could focus their efforts on that bar and ignore others. That's the it's kind of the problem right. with when you have layer upon layer of regulations. Like what's the old axiom? You know, everybody is violating some law at any given moment of the day. So you know, right? Uh, right. It, it, and that's kind of disturbing. And how do you run a business like that? How do you how do you stay in business like that? Yeah, well, and I think not only could it be targeted, but it's just it's never going to be consistent, even if you're trying not to target it. Just when you think about the size of uh, of a state like New York, I mean, of course, New York City could almost be its own state population wise. But then everywhere, all the geographical territory in upstate New York and western New York. And it's huge and they're never going to have enough agents to go everywhere. And some of them are going to get hit harder than others. And this is also, I think, importantly to keep in mind a time at which the restaurant industry is just struggling. I mean, it's, you know, one out of four restaurants are uh, saying that they're not going to survive through the pandemic. Um, so far, one in six are permanently closed, according to the latest uh, surveys of restaurant owners. Uh, staff's been furloughed everywhere. Uh, and you, we, we should be doing things to try to help them within reason that protects public health uh, instead of things that kind of hurt them without protecting public health. And I think that's the real kind of tragedy from a public policy perspective, at yeah. least. Well, and in North Carolina, when they first shut down 
the restaurants and bars and and, and everything. And then they started uh, doing their phased reopening. The governor here uh, allowed restaurants to open, but kept bars closed for, you know, eight months. Well, right right as he made the initial announcement that restaurants could open at a reduced capacity, the uh, the breweries started asking, well, hey, what are what about us? Because we're not yeah. a bar, but we're kind of not a restaurant. We're kind of this, you know, hybrid middle in between. And they came up with this justification here in the state where if you make the beer on premises, then that's acceptable, which is absurd. Like, so if I just if I bring the beer in on a truck versus bring the ingredients in on a truck, then somehow or another I'm operating safely. It, it doesn't right. make any sense. No, it doesn't. Yeah. And it's something you see even pre-COVID in terms of uh, of government treating different types of licensees for alcohol differently. So, you know, breweries are a different license than a restaurant than, than a bar. And I think people get really hung up on, you know, oh, bar. And we have this image in our mind of what a bar is or a club is and stuff. And I, I think that you can have the same public health requirements and create the same safe environment, no matter what type of licensee you have. I mean, just because it's a bar that normally people come into and maybe sing karaoke on Friday nights doesn't mean that during COVID, <laughs> you can't say, look, you need to have a table service here you know people maybe don't need that food but you know they can they can have their drinks separately from each other um and you know you only can have this amount of capacity inside um you know same with breweries same with uh family restaurants and so i I think that people just get really hung up on that in particular when when that's not really uh, uh particularly relevant More with Jared in a minute. First, if you are thinking about buying or selling your house, then uh, you know who to call. It's Rowena Patton and her all-star powerhouse team, right? You know this. I've been talking about her and her team for almost a decade now. She outsells 99% of the realtors in the state of North Carolina. She has homes uh, in all price points. She has buyers lined up. So what does all of this mean? Well, if you're thinking about buying a house, then she can find your dream home for you pretty quickly. Uh, Or if you are selling your house, then you're going to get your house sold very fast. And sometimes it's almost too fast for people. They weren't really prepared to actually move. They thought the process would take a lot longer. (laughs) Okay, so just be aware when you call her, she's going to get your house sold. That's what she does. 333-4483, mountainhomehunt.com. That's the website. Rowena Patton and her all-star powerhouse team, 333-4483. Call her today and then start packing. So um, our our governor made this connection, and ostensibly this is the same rationale for all of the shutdowns and targeted enforcement against bars, which is when people are drinking, they're going to be less inhibited and they're going to forget and they're you know they're they're going to get a little tipsy or completely wasted and they're they're not going to remember to have the mask on and they're not going to remember to be you know socially distant or if they're stumbling all over the place like right, they're going to violate all of these other executive orders and so that's why we need to restrict so severely the bars do you do you place yeah. value in that is that a rational justification well yeah i mean again we want people to be safe but i think that um you don't want people to get inebriated and go nuts. I mean, we already have laws against against over serving, but even if that was, if you were to credit that as as a concern, I think that again there would be more at least even ways to do it. Um, there might be ways that hurt even the businesses, but it'd be more even keeled. So if you're worried about, for example, that people are going to have a ton of you know drinks in a row and just get drunk because they're not eating you know they don't have food or they're just imbibing too much and then they'll start doing things that are dangerous you could even have a limit on maybe the number of drinks people have i mean i'm not necessarily endorsing that as a policy but at least it it strikes at the actual issue you're trying to address so maybe it's you know three beer limit for like a brewery or something like that and like again that could have negative consequences and i'm not uh advancing that as some panacea that's going to fix everything here. But at the same time, at least it would be consistent and it wouldn't just be this arbitrary stuff that would just be like, you know, require people to eat food when that may not be anything that's actually like helping anyone. And again, distinguishing between bars and against between restaurants and between breweries, between distilleries, stuff like that. So I think that there, if you have public health concerns, um, there would actually be targeted ways to to do it. They would at least go to the problem you're trying to address, which is to keep us all safe and not things that really have kind of a tenuous connection to it. So th- that's kind of my view of it. And again, you know, if as I said earlier, if, if uh, public health authorities think that 
there shouldn't be something like indoor dining, then great. Like, you know, we should refer to, we should defer to them in my opinion, but it's just when it gets so inconsistent uh, across different types of licensees and, and it's uh, rules that aren't necessarily protecting anyone or have a really uh, tenuous connection to public health, that that's what I think it becomes difficult. Right. And it also undermines credibility, which then jeopardizes the, the consent of the governed, you know, from a, right. with the elected officials that are trying to get people to follow their rules if you believe that and you're looking at this stuff as arbitrary, uh, then you're not going to you're not going to follow their rules because they they they're not going to have the credibility to convince us. Um, and I think that's right. kind of where we are now. I think a lot of people are getting to that point. They see a lot of these policymakers. Uh, I don't even want to say policymakers. They're just you know the governors, the edict issuers, and they're violating their own rules all over the place. <laughs> you know, and so well, what 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 message does that send? Like if if it doesn't seem like you're treating it very seriously, so why should we? Yeah, and, and and I think you know once more this is a, a pretty sympathetic you know population of, of predominantly small business owners uh, that are really struggling right now uh, that you know may not be able to literally pay the rent because their sales have uh, you know fallen by more than half and they're trying to do the right thing. I mean, I haven't talked to, I, I in, in my job I get to talk to a lot of people that work in bars and restaurants and and breweries and stuff and there's not one of them that I've talked to that is you know. It, that is anything other than extremely concerned for them and their staffs about their safety as well. They're just trying to, you know, make uh, whatever living they can in this mm -hmm. current context. And so I just, I, I wish sometimes there's a little bit more of a collaborative uh, posture from the government versus a combative one sometimes. Yeah. Um, this is a common refrain that I've found myself uttering over the last few weeks, maybe more carrots, fewer sticks. Um, right. So uh, my guest is Jarrett Dieterle. He is the director of, of Commercial Freedom and Resident Senior Fellow at the R Street Institute. You can read his work at rstreet.org. By the way, the R Street Institute works to expand bipartisan support for market-oriented policies. Uh, Jarrett is also the author of a book, Give Me Liberty and Give Me a Drink, 65 Cocktails to Protest America's Most Outlandish Alcohol Laws. So I'm kind of curious. I have to ask, how does one become an expert on alcohol? Besides, of course, just like lots of drinking, I assume. But how does one become that? <laughs> right. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, a lot of field research is absolutely right. necessary. Yeah. But uh, no, I, I originally got into it through kind of the uh, the, <laughs> the policy the policy uh, route, uh, working at a, a think tank at R Street. Um, we do a lot of different public policy issues, as you said, uh, but uh, the more I was looking at different kinds of rules and regulations that really were impacting businesses um, in nonsensical ways, I realized that there probably was no greater example of that in any industry that I could find as far as being uh, laboring under outdated and, and uh, kind of uh, crazy often uh, rules uh, than the alcohol industry and then and the alcohol marketplace. Um, a lot of it's because of our unique history with alcohol dating back to prohibition and prohibition's immediate aftermath. Um, it makes alcohol different. It's treated different even to this day than most other industries and things that we take for granted in other industries, we oftentimes find that, that, that they're not allowed in the alcohol marketplace. So I just started talking to more and more people that uh, work in the industry. I, I uh, grew to have a real fascination with uh, cocktails just independently of the policy aspect and beer independently of the uh, aspects. So it just made for a fun way to uh, fuse them together and, and think about it from a policy angle and uh, ultimately try to help some of the, the people that I really admire and that I look up to in the, in the drink space that are making all the wonderful beverages we enjoy every day. So I wonder, do you get to a point where you cross over, like where you're, you're knowledgeable when you go out to the bars with your friends and stuff, but then you get like too knowledgeable and now nobody wants to take you to the bars? Like, does that, do you reach a point? Are you worried that there's a point that you could hit like that? I uh, I try to I try to rein it on that. The one thing that <laughs> that will be tricky is that uh, we'll be out at um, uh, you know people know what I do now and friends and they'll actually ask me for some explanation about some really arcane like you know rule and and and, and you know the the state that we're in and and sometimes I just you know I don't know because there's so many you know keeping track of not only 50 different states but then all the locales within each state so uh, people more look at me as like a trivia like sounding board that should be able to like you know do quiz master on stuff and I I've gotten pretty good at that but I definitely am not uh, not perfect there's limits so it, to anyone's knowledge so it turns into like what stump Jarrett or 
something on booze laws? Right. Oh my goodness. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, <laughs> that's that's definitely uh, happened before. <laughs> All right. Well, it's always trivia night wherever you go. Right at any bar, it's always trivia night with you. Um, Seems like it. So, all right, so you write this book, Give Me Liberty and Give Me a Drink. So did this, uh, it sounds like this kind of came out of the work that you were doing. You encounter some of these just completely right. ridiculous rules and you're like, this should be a book. But then you're like, what, let me also throw some recipes in there? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's pretty much. I mean, I, I the more I talk to, as I said, people that work in the drink space, the brewers and the distillers, the bartenders, the more I realize that you know, it wasn't a, a one state uh, issue, it was a 50 state issue. And so I, I realized that, you know, someone needs to kind of talk about all the different stuff and, and maybe have an example from every state. So uh, that that's what kind of led to the book. And then I was like, you know, we are talking about alcohol. It's an inherently fun uh, topic. And so why not, you know, match it with alcohol recipes that are inspired by some of these crazy laws or, you know, maybe make fun of them in some way. And so th that's how it developed. I, I didn't want to write some huge academic tome, you know, that no one would read and wouldn't wouldn't really be interesting. I wanted to uh, create awareness. I wanted more people to learn about this, but also have a chuckle while doing it um, and, and, you know, realize that there's real importance to it, but uh, also uh, in a fun way that uh, that kind of makes light of it and kind of is part bar bizarre history, part trivia, uh, part, um, you know, uh, drinks books. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I just tried to have fun with it. And that's how it kind of led to, to what it was. So I have to ask you, do you ever watch Bar Rescue? Yeah, yeah, I've yeah. seen it before. It's a good show. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, well, absolutely. I, it, my wife and I will put that on in the background, like on a weekend when they do their marathons. And it's just interesting. I used to work in bars and restaurants and so long time ago. And so um, yeah. I, I get a kick out of seeing some of these just complete train wrecks of, you know, places and people that are operating. But uh, some of the science behind this and, and the history that they'll throw in every now and again. So let me run this past you. Uh, I'll play uh, Stump Jarrett. Let's see if, if this is true. I don't know if it's true. It's I recall it being on the show, maybe not, um, that the idea of mixing drinks kind of came about in in order to mask just the awfulness of a lot of the alcohol that was being produced during Prohibition because it was all being made, you know, in back alleys or bathtubs, right? Uh, and so people were fine. They, they just needed to find any way to mask the awfulness of the alcohol. Is there any validity to that? <laughs> yeah, that, that's a good question. It so there is some uh, 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 shade of that. Some cocktails developed out of the Prohibition era. Um, for example, the Bee's Knees is a popular uh, one um, that oftentimes people would have kind of bathtub gin that wasn't very good. And they would want to have something to kind of some agent to mask that. So honey and lemon in that case mm. um, were, were, were two that would, that would help with that. Uh, it's a great cocktail, though. I mean, you can put good spirits in it. And I, I did drink it all the time, frankly. Uh, but but it, it, it's not where all cocktails came from. Um, it's a little bit of a myth. There was actually an incredibly rich tradition in American history pre-prohibition uh it's it's often referred to now by cocktail nerds as the golden age of cocktails actually uh before prohibition happened of really really sophisticated uh bartenders um predominantly in, in uh, bigger cities uh, and they would use uh all fresh juices, uh, uh, all different kinds of bitters, the amount of bitters that existed in that era, are actually probably more even than the recent explosion, uh, explosion of different types of, of mm. bitters. And and they often had access to, to pretty good spirits, not not always, but often they did. And so uh, imported spirits or, or, or ones that were made uh, uh, locally or domestically. And so, yeah, they, that, that really is where probably our cocktail culture uh, uh, traces its real heritage. And uh, it's only been kind of recently prohibition. The problem is when prohibition happened, all that went away because all of a sudden you had all these really uh, accomplished, talented bartenders and they no longer had a job or an industry or a career. And so a lot of them either went to something else and permanently retired or uh, many of them moved overseas uh, to operate uh, bars. And so, uh, yeah, it, 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 it was also, that that early era um, that, that cocktails kind of uh, developed from at least what we conceptualize as, as the cocktails, things like punch were uh, around even before that. Uh, mm. So, yeah, there, there's, there's some amount of that. There was a lot of different stuff that was used during Prohibition to try to mask uh, lower quality booze, but it's not just from that. All right. More about cocktails with Jared in a minute. First, let me tell you about never mowing the yard again. If you get the Husqvarna auto mower from General Equipment Rental, you won't ever have to really mow the yard again. How awesome is that? This this little Roomba for your for your lawn, it, it drives all around, it cuts the grass, 
and you can actually watch it on your smartphone. Uh, it maps the perimeter of your yard. So by the way, if somebody picks it up and tries to steal it, it shuts down once it gets beyond the perimeter and the GPS locator uh, means that you're going to be able to track down the thief immediately. And if you go to General Equipment Rental, you get 10% off while supplies last. They're also running 10% off your first rental, okay? So if you want to pick up the auto mower or any, really, Husqvarna and Honda outdoor power equipment, General Equipment Rental is where you go. They're your official sales and service provider. Uh, they also do equipment service and repair as well. Um, but also, and this is what really is their bread and butter, which is the rentals, right? Right. People need tools, but you don't want to go out and buy a tool for one project. Uh, like, for example, you need to put up a fence. Are you going to buy an auger for, you know, for once one time you do the fence project? No, you just rent it. It's just a great idea. If you're a general contractor, rent the tool you need, get the job done, get paid, and you don't even have to then buy the tool because you only needed it for the one job. Go to General Equipment Rental, family owned and operated. They're in Weaverville. They're at the intersection of Merriman Avenue and Reams Creek Road, so really convenient to get there. Great folks, a great business, and please, again, support the, the businesses that support this show. General Equipment Rental, generalrents.com, and think outside your toolbox. Jarrett Dieterle is the author of the book, Give Me Liberty and Give Me a Drink, 65 Cocktails to Protest America's Most Outlandish Alcohol Laws, which, by the way, great addition to anybody uh, who you know in your life, maybe a Christmas present that likes to uh, make their own drinks and is interested in public policy as well. This is a great addition. They can leave it on the bar. Um, So let me ask you about prohibition, because you mentioned it there. Uh, The 18th Amendment, right, 1920, prohibition starts up. North Carolina, we were a bit of a trendsetter in this area. Uh, we North Carolina did prohibition like 12 years before the rest of America got around to doing it. It actually gave rise to NASCAR, right? Like that's how <laughs> that's how we mm-hmm. ended up with the race car uh, industry because uh, these were uh, bootleggers that were running moonshine all around and, and buying up in Virginia and running it down into North Carolina and the like. Um, and then also North Carolina was the last, actually, I don't think we ever did repeal uh, the 20 uh, or a vote to repeal prohibition, sign on to the 21st Amendment. Um, but it finally allowed booze in 1937, which was like four years after uh, everybody else said, oh, that was a mistake. Let's let's start drinking again. Um, so what what can you tell us about some of the or one of the wacky laws that are still <laughs> left over in this state that seems to be a little bit drier than everywhere else, at least historically? <laughs> Yeah, well, you're right. After prohibition got repealed, some states stayed dry for a long time. I think uh, as um, I believe it was maybe Kansas was the uh, uh, last state. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head right now that that ultimately decided to uh, uh, overturn that on a statewide level. It was not until like the 60s, I think. But wow. uh, but yeah, uh, it, we still have dry counties, of course. Uh, another feature, you know, from uh, prohibition. Um, that carried over after that, even after many states got rid of their laws, eventually uh, a lot of counties haven't. And I I believe North Carolina might still have one uh, dry county um, in its uh, western uh, region. So that's one example. But you also have seen other things, uh, again, going back to this uh, long history of trying to tether food um, and alcohol together. Uh, uh, North Carolina does not um, uh, allow discounts on drinks in the same way that uh, many states do. Um, you can get food discounts uh, for happy hour, uh, of course, um, but uh, not uh, as much for the drinks discounts. Also, <laughs> North Carolina is still one of the control states. It's uh, got ABC stores where you uh, purchase mm-hmm. uh, distilled spirits, Virginia. My uh, state of residence is, is the same way. And and, and those are also something that really took off after prohibition. People kind of, you know, go out and celebrate repeal day on December 5th every year, and kind of raise their glasses to, to freedom. But what they don't realize is that, that all the pro temperance people just didn't disappear overnight. They kind of just changed costumes and started uh, doing stuff at the state and local level. And so that's where things like control states came. They wanted to still control people's access to alcohol. They were very leery of, of people kind of having unbridled access to it. And so, uh, every state has uh, vestiges from prohibition, uh, and you know North Carolina is no exception. Yeah, um, the ABC store uh, 
the setup here is just ridiculous. The, I, I remember a couple of years ago, just by coincidence, my wife was in South Carolina. We were down in the Charlotte area. She was across the border visiting some friends, and we were going to – I forget where we were going. We were like, we need to buy a bottle of, of um, whiskey. And so she picked one up at a store down there, and I picked one up unknowingly, picked one up also in – charlotte and so we both bought the exact same bottle <laughs> and then we compared the receipts and the north carolina bottle had like two or three times the amount of tax just because it came through that abc system than the south carolina uh, did now of course south carolina their long history with the mini bottle <laughs> right that, that, that was the only alcohol you could buy for a very long time right liquor by the uh, by the airplane bottle in the bars um which i never minded so much because it's actually more than a shot so when you get the uh, the the mini bottles, it's actually more than one shot. Um, mm-hmm. So South Carolina's got some wacky ones too, I'm sure. And uh, what Tennessee? So what what were some of the some of the weirdest ones that you've come up that you've come across? Yeah, uh, as far as crazy laws, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it, it, it's hard to choose. Um, it, it's like uh, uh, choosing among children, maybe, but the opposite <laughs> uh, you don't love any of them. Uh, yeah, Utah's got uh, a Hall of Fame, uh, you know, first ballot Hall of Famer with its uh, so-called Zion Curtain, which is a rule that requires a uh, actual uh, wall or some kind of partition or buffer zone now that separates the bartender making cocktails from uh, the uh, customers that are actually ordering it. What? Uh, and yeah, yeah. And so I guess the theory being is it's too dangerous. You can get your cocktail, but it's too dangerous to watch someone make it. Uh, so that that's uh, something that is unique uh, to Utah um, and is uh, always a, a real eye opener, I think, to a lot of people. So do uh, they, another, they, I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt, but like, yeah. have you ever been to Utah or seen how this actually operates? Because like, I, I got questions now. Like, is this is it like the old peep shows that you used to see, like a Times Square where you like put money in and like there's a there's like a wall or something that comes down or raises up between you and the bartender? How do, or they just make yeah. them back in a kitchen? Like, how, how does that work? They've actually, a lot of the bars there have had to construct actual, as ridiculous as it sounds, floor to ceiling walls, like that areas behind which the bartenders go to actually make the cocktails. Uh, so it's you know different than what a lot of us are, are used to, you know, bars in, in <laughs> our, our states where, you know, you, the bartender is doing it right there. The drinks are all behind them. They actually go to a place where you can't watch it uh, being made. Uh, in in the bars and then come back with the actual cocktail. I, I know it sounds ridiculous, but uh, that that's true. They've tried to reform it a little bit over the years. Um, yeah, again, restaurants sometimes can uh, not have to do it if they're classified differently. They've also uh, said that you could have um, you know things like buffer zones or some area between uh, the customer and the bar. So they've tried to reform it, but it all kind of still boils down to this idea that there needs to be some kind of physical space between bartender and uh and and customer which is nuts i want to see the drink getting made not that i don't trust the bartender but i don't trust the bartender no i mean like i do kind of but i want to see it being made especially you know people's concerns about stuff getting slipped in drinks but also i want to know like if if i order something i want to see them make it so i know they're doing it correctly right yeah well and also i mean the fun part about uh high-end craft cocktail bars now too is you can actually learn a lot it's it's fun to watch a bartender i mean they're doing all kinds of cool stuff and so yeah it's kind of a bummer not being able to watch it being made actually yeah and so you got i mean it actually probably induces laziness because now the bartenders aren't performing because it is a performance to some degree and the good bartenders you know who can uh, work that into the performance and include the crowd they get better tips now you just mm-hmm, send them exactly. back behind a wall <laughs> and I have no idea. And they just come yeah. out like, well, did you actually make that? Or is there some dispenser back there? I mean, what am I saying? Actually, <laughs> I'm just I'm a straight whiskey kind of guy. So I'm not even asking for the mixed drinks like you could just pour it in front of me, man. So Utah, that's <laughs> right. pretty. Uh, that is a uh, that's a pretty wild one. Um, yeah. What else? Yeah, any others come to mind? Yeah, yeah. Another another one that's, uh, again, uh, uh, kind of a, a, a Hall of Famer is uh, Indiana's uh, warm beer law. So uh, gas stations and convenience stores in Indiana, they can sell beer, but they cannot literally put it in a refrigerator or a cooler to sell you cold beer. It has to be room temperature <laughs> beer in Indiana. Uh, it's been a whole uh, a long kerfuffle there over this law. Uh, the liquor store licensees, they are a different type of licensee they are allowed to sell cold beer 
the gas station convenience stores go every year to the state legislature to try to get this changed. And the liquor store lobby uh, tries very hard to keep it in place. Uh, the gas stations can chill wine, but they cannot chill beer. So that's uh, another just one of these laws that you're wondering, what are, what are we doing here? You know, is this really protecting anyone uh, or is, is the real reason just because someone's trying to kind of protect their economic interests? Ding, 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 ding. Yes, that's the answer. Whenever yep. <laughs> it's like franchises or licensing and stuff, it's it, it, all of that. It's it's usually established uh, actors in the economy and in industry that are trying to set up barriers for entry for others that would compete with them. That's usually the case. So I would submit that's probably it. Uh, yep. the, yeah, the liquor stores don't want the competition. Now, if I'm owning a convenience store, a gas station, maybe I set up a chilled section for the wine and then just pile the beer next to it. Like, just to... so they've gotten, they've had some clever workarounds. I mean, the free, you know, the market never, never uh, stands still. So right. they, they have these, uh, what are called chill bags there, which are made specifically <laughs> for there. And they basically, if they're filled with ice and the gas stations can provide you with the ice, they apparently will chill your beer to the level it would be in a refrigerator within 15 minutes. Uh, they apparently work pretty well. Um, but, you know, they cost three bucks to add on your order. So ultimately, the customer, you know, has to, pay that extra thing if they want to go grab a cold beer and bring it to the to the barbecue so the market's found a workaround but you know again it's just adding an extra layer of cost and complexity onto it unfortunately one one gas station tried to get around it they installed uh like two tables in their gas station started selling burritos so they could get a restaurant permit <laughs> and you can chill beer if you have a restaurant permit and then the the state government absolutely freaked out and uh, shut down that loophole uh, too. So yeah, it's, it's just been an ongoing saga in Indiana. Indiana, man, which is weird because from what I've heard of Indiana, like warm beer is, is pretty regular up there. No, I'm kidding. I, I'm just joking. I don't know anything about Indiana beer. Um, so uh, do you have anything else on this you want to add uh, that you think is important or interesting that you want people to know before we let you run? The only thing I'd, I'd uh, say just to, to kind of uh, tie a bow on it all is that uh, a lot of this uh, uh, area uh, of, the, of the marketplace and of the legal system has not changed, as we said, since prohibition. But uh, COVID, one of the uh, few maybe only silver linings of, of COVID is that it has started changing some of the rules around alcohol delivery and, and shipping. And again, I think it's something that uh, a lot of people don't realize it, it depends on kind of where you live, but something as simple as uh, shipping a bottle of bourbon from uh, across state lines to your state uh, is, is almost impossible unless you live in a handful of states. Uh, and uh, that, that, that we, we just, you know, we're used to everything in our doors right now, especially during COVID, everything from pharmaceutical drugs to, uh, you know, just really silly things we can get in a couple days at our door. And, and you can't uh, oftentimes uh, with, with alcohol. And so COVID has started uh, changing some of that. Lawmakers are realizing that's kind of silly. It doesn't really make sense anymore. Uh, and it would, uh, in a lot of ways, be better to have people get alcohol delivered. It could reduce people driving with, with alcohol and stuff like that. So I, I think that that is one uh, upbeat uh, silver lining in all of this um, is that people, are, uh, lawmakers are really starting to rethink that. And hopefully that'll uh, help change and update some of these rules we've been talking about. Yeah. It, in uh, North Carolina, the ABC stores were deemed to be essential businesses. They got to stay open. And I remember mm -hmm. somebody making the argument, well, you know, you don't want people who are alcoholics to not get their alcohol because then then it would be worse for the people in their homes. Like, right. Wow. That's quite a rationalization. <laughs> But keep the bars closed. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. All righty. Uh, Jared Dieterle, the author of the book, Give Me Liberty and Give Me a Drink, 65 Cocktails to Protest America's Most Outlandish Alcohol Laws. You can find that, by the way, at Amazon and all uh, online book dealers. Are you in uh, Are you in the brick and mortar stores as well with this? Yeah, yeah. All major and independent uh, bookstores, um, if you're able to, to get into them nowadays, uh, have it. And, uh, obviously, on online on all the usual bookselling websites as well. He is also a resident senior fellow at the R Street Institute. You can read his work at rstreet.org. Jared, thanks so much for your time. I appreciate it. I enjoyed it. Love to have you back on the show sometime. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it greatly. All right. Something else that you will appreciate is a great mattress. I know I do. Christy and I, we have the King Size Memory Foam Mattress. We picked it up from Mattress Man, and you can as well. They have Memory Foam, obviously, but they also have all of the different kinds of mattresses, whether you're looking for 
uh, traditional inner spring mattresses or pocketed springs or pillow top mattresses, natural latex, hand t- uh, hand tufted, uh, two sided hotel foam. They have adjustable bases as well. They have the Biltmore collection made by Restonic. There's a whole line of mattresses. They're made in Fayetteville. These are the mattresses that are at the Biltmore Hotel and Inn. Uh, so both of those facilities at the Biltmore Estate. They use these mattresses, and if you want them, you got to go to Mattress Man. Uh, they also have Nature's Spa, which is the newest line of mattresses from Paramount Sleep. That is a series of hybrid mattresses. These are sold through Bloomingdale's, the high-end department store, and they're featured at Blackberry Farm in Tennessee. So uh, if you are looking for a quality mattress at a great price, go to Mattress Man. Four stores in Asheville, Arden, and Hendersonville. They do ship nationwide, so go to mattressmanstores.com. Uh, they have local five star delivery service and a 120 day comfort guarantee experience the difference at mattress man mattressmanstores.com buy local and sleep better so governor cooper is urging all local governments to enforce his stay at home safer at home executive order the the shio he wants them to uh enforce these with civil penalties they sent a letter. He, uh, his administration sent a letter to local governments the other day. Uh, he was asked about this at his press conference, his regular COVID briefing that he does. Um, and he says, we have to see our trends that are all going up right now. He says, we have to see them turn around. Last week, Dr. Cohen, our Department of Public Safety Secretary Eric, Eric Hooks, and I, sent a letter to local government officials. We're urging them to help us with enforcement of executive orders to help slow the spread of the virus. Local governments can enforce safety protocols with civil penalties, including fines for violations, instead of criminal charges, which we believe can be more effective. An advisory opinion from the Attorney General's office answers the legal questions. And what we need now is their determination to keep communities safe. Our aim is not to get people in trouble. It's to get people to do the right things to slow the spread of this virus and to keep it from overwhelming our hospital systems. I'm grateful to the many local governments already taking action to keep their communities safe. So next up, then, Kim King in the reporter Q&A portion of the briefing. Kim King from WLOS then asked about the lack of enforcement in Buncombe County specifically. Good afternoon, Governor. Um, I have a question for you about enforcement of restaurants and businesses who have been violating. Uh, Back when you issued your order in November, our local leaders, including the Buncombe chairman and uh, the emergency preparedness director, said that they were going to crack down on businesses and fine them $50.00 and then subsequently potentially shut them down. They haven't issued one citation. What would you say in response to that? They've received over 145 complaints. Um, What are you asking of local officials, and what would you hope that they did? Well, we think enforcement of the executive orders is important, not just to get people in trouble. We don't want to get people in trouble, but to make sure we slow the spread of this virus. And local governments can help us by adopting ordinances that allow them to uh, impose fines or penalties. Under state law, the only uh, action that we can take or law enforcement can take is to charge with a misdemeanor. So having multiple options for a local government can be a better way to enforce and to try to get businesses and everyday people to comply with these orders in order to slow the spread of the virus. I don't know about the statistics that you mentioned. I'm I'm glad that the county of Buncombe and I believe the city of Asheville have taken the steps to adopt the ordinances. Uh, I feel confident that a lot of businesses are abiding by the orders and may even be doing it more so, realizing that Uh, Local governments can come in and may come in to enforce those orders. So I think that that's positive. Also, our Department of Health and Human Services has taken some action working with local health departments on businesses that continue to violate the rules. So we are having enforcement across the state. 
This effort with this letter we sent out to local government officials across the state, we're hoping that more local governments will be involved and will step up. Right. So let's crack down more on the gov- on the uh, businesses that are not doing what we demand. But we don't want criminal penalties. See, this is the balancing act that you want to go after people, but you don't want to give them a record, especially if you've got, uh, you know, a minority owned business. Right. People who aren't wearing masks and socially distancing. Do you really want to hang criminal charges on them for the rest of their lives? So how about by, by the way, this was a, uh, the the explicit discussion and debate at the Buncombe County Commissioner's meeting several months ago when they were deciding whether to do the mask mandate um, and impose civil penalties. That's, you know, civil penalties. So that's the this is the line they're trying to walk. Do civil penalties. Uh, penalties, civil infractions, so this way you can charge them a bunch of money, but you don't charge them with crimes, because that's what you have to do under the state law. Now, what's interesting here is that there is this, he cites this letter and this uh, advisory opinion from the Attorney General's office. I'm going to get to that in a minute. First, you need to get over to Old Grouch's military surplus. Uh, If you are interested in getting some cold weather gear before the cold weather really gets here, then get to Old Grouch's. They are in downtown Clyde on Main Street, across the street from the anti-aircraft gun. They've got military-grade thermal underwear. They've got wool sweaters. Uh, They've got uh, camo and solid green military field jackets, wool and fleece toboggans, wool socks, Gore-Tex jackets. Uh, and they've got tons of ideas for hard to shop for, hard to buy for uh, family members and friends of yours around Christmas. You can pick up some really unique items at Old Grouch's Military Surplus, again, downtown Clyde, and at oldgrouch.com. So Governor Cooper has uh, a letter that goes out to the uh, local jurisdiction saying, hey, you guys can totally crack down. You got to use the uh, civil penalties, though. Don't use criminal penalties because that's what the state requires. The opinion is written by Roy Cooper's deputy general counsel, Blake Thomas, uh, who also notes that the advisory opinion is not a formal attorney general's opinion as it has not been reviewed by their procedures. Why is that important? Well, uh, there is apparently some bit of debate about whether or not the governor can tell locals that they can do more than what the law requires. Because in North Carolina, there is a common law, uh, a common law that states uh, where state statutes make certain conduct into a criminal offense, a city may not adopt an ordinance dealing with the same conduct. And so, what the governor is saying and his lawyer is saying, like, well, you can you can go above and beyond what we are setting a floor for. You know, we're saying you got to do this. And I know that the common law says that you're not allowed to do anything if we're already doing it. But the, you know, emergency order that I put in place, it says you can do more. So we're going to go with that interpretation. Now, I'm curious if any attorney is going to be challenging any of this at any point in the future. Maybe this is why some of the local jurisdictions are hesitant to, um, you know, to start cracking down using these types of laws, because maybe the, um, you know, maybe the law isn't exactly as clear as the governor would like us to believe. So if you want access, by the way, to the orders, uh, to the links on everything that I've talked about, you just go to thepetecalendarshow.com and become a patron. All of it is available as part of the prep sheet every single day. That is a wrap for this episode. I do appreciate you listening. Remember, subscribe to the podcast. Give it a positive review. Uh, consider becoming a patron of the show. Get cool stuff, exclusive content. It's all at thepetecalendarshow.com. Thanks again for listening, and uh, we'll talk with you later. Don't break anything while I'm gone.